Hey, I'm Damon, and most of you on this channel already know how deeply influenced I am by liberation theology. And so today I want to talk about how liberation theology shaped me, what liberation theology is, and how I would even say it saved my life and my faith. Let's talk about it. So I'm going to talk about a bit of some of my theological transitions over the years without really talking about some of the life events that led to those transitions because that'll make this video too off topic and maybe kind of boring. Let me know if you want to hear more of that for another video. But anyway, okay, so first off, my parents grew up very loosely Catholic, but spirituality wasn't a part of their lives really at all. And when I was a baby, I got baptized in the Catholic Church. But then a couple years later, my parents individually realized that they needed to radically change their lives. At the time, they were both drug addicts, alcoholics. My dad had been a gang member, and they both really wanted some freedom in their lives. They both had pretty wild lives growing up and they wanted some freedom from things like addictions and unresolved grief issues and some other issues. And they ended up finding themselves in a Pentecostal church that specialized in deliverance ministry. So they dived fully into it and became full on evangelicals, raised me and my older siblings evangelical. And my early childhood was them learning how to be Christian. But for them, Christianity was always and still is always about helping people find freedom in their lives in difficult circumstances and then learning how to keep up that freedom within community. I grew up only kind of caring about it and then when I was 19 I had a sort of mystical experience and then decided to care a lot about it and dived fully in and studied a lot of theology and philosophy and history and then later I became a youth and young adults pastor and then after a while of that I ended up leaving evangelicalism because my theology had outgrown it, basically. A lot of people leave evangelicalism because they feel like they were pushed out. I felt like I left because I felt like I was being pulled out by something way better and deeper. And two schools of thought that had a very deep impact on my journey, I'm only talking about two of them today, were radical theology and liberation theology. Radical theology, or also called death of God theology, was popularized in the 60s and the way I could like I guess super duper briefly explain it, it's kind of complex, is basically it acknowledges we went to space, found no gods there, and the Holocaust happened and no gods intervened. Therefore, the ways that we've talked about God throughout history no longer work. They don't make sense for our modern world, which was really what Nietzsche was talking about in his man-man parable when he wrote God is dead. Or as Ken Dobson said, who was also very influenced by radical theology, to his mega church before he stepped down as the pastor, we don't know what we mean by God anymore. So radical theology encourages you to go through through that critical fire of deconstruction and see what's left on the other side. Some radical theologians come out the other side as atheists, some come out the other side as post-theists, some come out as panentheists, and all come out as poets, for sure. So one of the big questions radical theology proposes is what kind of God language actually matters after the death of God, which leads to a kind of radical theological essentialism, I would say, too. And so some of these radical theologians, namely John Caputo, which is a very huge influence on me, helped me realize, oh, the only God language that matters now is a language that actually reclaims the radical core of all religions and lifts up the poor and the oppressed. So through the necessary fire of radical death of God theology, I realized for me, the only theology that kind of really matters for me right now is liberation theology. Now I first got a little taste of liberation theology in around 2012 when I was getting into basic progressive Christianity and read a book by Rob Bell and Don Golden called Jesus wants to save Christians, a manifesto for the church in exile. Basically going through the historical biblical narrative through the lens of the poor and the oppressed. And a quick summary of this reading of the biblical narrative is we start with Israel, 
enslaved under Egypt, and they cry out to God to save them. And then through Moses, God liberates them from slavery in Egypt, takes them to Mount Sinai, gives them commandments to be a special, different kind of nation that exists to bless all the other nations, a tribe that blesses all the other tribes and takes care of one another and takes care especially of the poor and the oppressed and maintains justice. That is what the commandments were meant for, not to police all their behaviors. He was giving them an instruction for a way of life to live justly and to avoid becoming exploitative like Egypt had done to them. Then hundreds of years later, they kind of forget and they look around at all the neighboring nations and say, we want to be like these other nations, mainly because of how rich they are. Not fully understanding the only reason they were rich was because they were exploiting and impressing so many people. And God was like, no, we're not like that. We don't do that here, basically. And they're like, no, please, please give us a king. And he's like, fine, but I told y'all. And then they get king Saul, then King David, then King Solomon, who has a temple built for God using slaves. <laughs> and he ends up expanding the empire in a very imperialist manner and becomes just like Pharaoh that their people had just ran away from hundreds of years before. And then God was like, I told y'all, kicks them out of the land, allows Babylon to capture them, enslave them, and oppress them. And all the prophetic books take place before, during, and after this exile. First, the prophets saying, hey, guys, remember we're supposed to take care of the poor and maintain justice. Something might happen to us if we don't. And then during saying, hey, guys, all this chaos around us is happening because we didn't take care of the poor and maintain justice. And then after crying out to God to rescue them again like he did when he sent Moses which is the messianic prophecies then a couple empires later Jesus shows up while they're under the impression of the Roman Empire and reminds them of who they are of their original calling to take care of the poor and maintain justice and to be a tribe that blesses the other tribes and then gets killed and is basically like get it guys cool Try again. Peace out. That's the entire Bible. And it's not about taking any of that literally or historically, but about seeing it as a mythical pattern that we follow through on. So after studying a lot of New Exodus theology and a lot of also modern day poverty issues, I realized a lot of these ideas were very much influenced by liberation theology, which was a movement started in the 60s. So let me give you a very extremely brief overview of the history of liberation theology. So as we know, Christianity was brought to the Americas through colonization, the English bringing Protestant Christianity to North America and the Spanish bringing Catholic Christianity to Latin America. It was a conservative Christianity that encouraged people to be obedient to the white man and to the ruling class. And so Christianity, particularly Catholicism, was very conservative up until the Vatican II Council opened in Rome. Thousands of bishops convened, opened in Rome around 1962, and then closed in 1965. And it was to address pretty much the new pluralism of the modern Western world. And it led to changes like revisions to the liturgy and mass, and actually leading the mass in the vernacular of the people and not Latin, and a new permission to work with non-Catholic Christians to achieve similar goals, but also to celebrate the truths found in other religions as well. It was a very, very big deal, and it also encouraged bishops from all over the world to convene and talk about how we can creatively do our theology in response to the modern world. And so when a bunch of Latin American bishops got together in a much smaller conference in Medellin, Colombia, the issues of the modern world and their context largely had to do with underdevelopment and poverty. The same issues that many militant socialist groups were responding to at the time in many Latin American countries after the Cuban Socialist Revolution. And so within that context, it was very clear to these bishops that any changes in theology had to address 
the issues of the poor and the oppressed all around them. The mission of the church had to do something about the material conditions of the poor and the oppressed and not to just be all about some other world. And so after that and several other meetings afterwards and also inspired by several Catholic social thought documents, which was just starting to barely touch on it, out of that arose liberation theology, coined by Peruvian priest Gustavo Gutierrez, who wrote a book called Teologia de la Liberación, or a theology of liberation, or just liberation theology. And the main concept from all these meetings and subsequent books and articles and sermons was the concept that the church had to take a preferential option for the poor because God takes a preferential option for the poor. That's the slogan right there. Preferential option for the poor. God does take sides. And he takes the sides of the poor and the oppressed. And many people would call liberation theology specifically a contextual theology, even though all theology is contextual, but it's especially contextual because it looks at the lives of the poor and the oppressed around them. And out of that, out of seeing that, arises theology and therefore also reads the bible from the perspective of the poor and the oppressed which isn't that hard to do because it, the entire thing is written by the poor and the oppressed and it then sees parallels between their conditions and the poor and oppressed today their conditions and it especially sees parallels between jesus who is a poor working class minority executed by the state with people who are today poor and working class and under the threat of the state. And then this eventually spread to the United States to eventually formulate black liberation theology, primarily formulated by James Cone. And he was responding to the oppression of black people in America and put out a book in 1969 called Black Theology and Black Power. He was trying to find a synthesis between MLK and Malcolm X also through reading the Bible and engaging with liberation theology. And then the last book he released in 2011 before he died in 2018 was this classic, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, which sees parallels between the lynching of black people in America and the crucifixion and points out Christians who were doing lynchings should have seen the obvious connection. And it's all about showing how God is always in solidarity with people who are oppressed. And then it also led to people like Mary Daly formulating feminist theology, responding to the oppression of women. And then it led to people like Marcella Althias Reed to formulate queer theology, responding to the oppression of LGBTQ people. And so in my spiritual journey of studying theology, philosophy, politics, history, I got to a point where I no longer had any use for the language of God or spirit that didn't address the very real suffering all over the world. And without liberation theology, I probably would no longer be Christian. But also without liberation theology, I probably wouldn't have that much hope. And hope was something I desperately needed last year when I was in a very dark, scary, depressing period of my life after leaving such a huge evangelical community and losing so many friends and the trauma and grief of that ended up catching up with me a couple years later. Talking about God and spirituality in this way is what keeps me going. And like I said, it's sort of essentialist. This theology has actual sustenance to it. I realized so much of evangelical theology just feels like being fed nothing but candy. Liberation theology felt like actual meat finally, or dare I say bread. And it's interesting how this concept of bread is so prevalent in these leftist conversations and revolutionary politics and workers' rights, because Jesus said things like, I am the bread of life, and take this bread, this is my body, eat it, and remembrance of me, which can be read as remembering, but also literally remembering. And verses like that make so much more sense when you're able to see them through a lens that what actually matters is how we treat the poor and the oppressed, the hungry, the thirsty, the needy. In the whole Bible, God never judges the poor and the oppressed. God only judges people for how they treat the poor and the oppressed. That's what the Bible is actually about. And so through this journey, I now find myself in community with a lot of non-religious leftists because I believe we share a lot of similar goals. 
The Brazilian liberation theologian and priest Frei Beto was arrested and tortured and imprisoned in the early 1970s. He had been working with a lot of leftist militants, guerrilla fighters, and Marxist writers and politicians. And he was asked by his police interrogator, how can a Christian collaborate with a communist? And Frei Beto responded by saying, for me, men are not divided into believers and atheists, but between oppressors and oppressed, between those who want to keep this unjust society and those who want to struggle for justice. And then the policeman said, have you forgotten that Marx considered religion to be the opium of the people? And then Beto insisted it is the bourgeoisie which has turned religion into an opium of the people by preaching a God Lord of the heavens only while taking possession of the earth for itself. So as a liberation theologian, I am part of the stream of Christianity that has always existed that is struggling for justice. I know that there's plenty of colonizing Christianity out there. That's not the stream that I'm a part of. Or as Cornel West likes to make the distinction between Constantinian Christianity and prophetic Christianity. I'm part of the prophetic Christianity. So thank you for watching. I'm so thankful that people can engage with these ideas from all kinds of different perspectives. I very much enjoy it and talking with you all. So leave a comment. Let me know what you're thinking. Subscribe for more content like this and make sure to support me on Patreon. Shout out my two very first patron supporters, Jacob McCarthy and Refined Your Scene. You are so awesome. So go check that out in the links in the description. See you later. Mm -hmm.